Smith service. Carrière Costi au pilot. So, we have known each other for... Toujours aussi super. Ah, merci. Joe, is he going to be a supporter? His Excellency, thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure. And congratulations for all what you're doing, which is splendid. Well, uh, thank you for trying hard. Very impressive. But, uh, <laughs> It's a really great, great honor and a great pleasure at the same time to welcome you all on behalf of the Cyprus Institute to our international conference, Climate Change in the Mediterranean and Middle East, Challenges and Solutions. The conference is organized under the aegis of the President of the Republic of Cyprus and with the support of the European Commission representative in Cyprus, concrete manifestations of the importance of this conference. We are proud that we have succeeded to have a truly outstanding participation of leaders from the international scientific and policy community and representatives of key stakeholders. Participation, I just uh, learned the latest statistics, we have from 35 countries and we have above 300 registered uh, participants. From Europe, North Africa, Middle East, um, but also from North America, Central Asia, South and East Asia. I would like to thank you, Mr. President, for your very kind invitation to open the debate this morning, along with the Cyprus Minister of Education. The high level and stimulating program of this two-day conference, the outstanding participants, underline the quality and dynamism of the Cyprus Institute, which has become a key research and education institution, especially on climate and environmental issues. I've been asked to give my views, I understand not as president of the Constitutional Court, but as former negotiator and president of COP21, to give my views on this broad question. Where do we stand today in terms of climate action? I will try to answer. Then I will say a few words about an uh, initiative that uh, I've launched with many other specialists and which now has been endorsed by the French President Macron and which is just now being discussed by the UN, uh, the name of which is the Global Pact for the Environment. But first, I would like to draw briefly a broad picture of uh, where we are as far as climate action is concerned. And I will speak bluntly. The situation is worrisome. The adoption of the Paris Agreement in December 2015 was in itself a very successful step and it has been considered as a turning point. 195 countries decided to adopt the first universal climate pact in history. We achieved a robust agreement, which is simultaneously universal, ambitious, fair, and I would say as legally binding as possible in those circumstances. As you know, it includes, and this result was far from settled in advance, 
The objective of holding the increase in the global average temperature to, quote, well below two degrees, above pre-industrial levels, and, quote, of pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to only 1.5 degrees. It includes as well the aim of carbon neutrality by the second half of the century. And this formula is a bit general. Furthermore, and it is very important, a mechanism for a five yearly review of commitments is planned with the obligation of always going upwards in the ambition and no backsliding. This success was achieved, maybe partly because of an exceptional diplomatic endeavor, but mostly it was due to a context that previous conferences did not enjoy. If we want, and it's an absolute necessity, to move forward, we have to know exactly what is the situation and what are the challenges. It is why this conference and our common efforts are so important. Not only we cannot slow down, but on the contrary, we need to speed up the pace. The environmental threat is planetary, therefore the response must be planetary too, and an institute like ours plays a decisive role in this direction. Thank you. Cyprus, a country that is already experiencing the impacts of climate change, strongly supports international and regional scientific initiatives and cooperation in order to address this challenge. Within this framework, our country is coordinating a project proposal titled Development of a Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Observatory. The project concept note has been approved by the European Commission, and we have recently submitted a full proposal to the live 2017 call. The project, the project work will be assisted by the Cyclatap Scientific Advisory Committee consisting of leading national, regional, and international experts on climate change, including experts from the Cyprus Institute and other regional partners. The role of tertiary education beyond research and innovation in the field of climate change is crucial to the formation of professionals, scientists, and citizens. Solution. Solution is something also related to the possibility to make some calculation about when we are investing in mitigation, what is the, the cost benefit? And this figure was provided by, by a study by the World Bank that shows that above this red line, any investment is positive. Any investment in mitigation is positive, became positive. Of course, below it is still negative. But that means if you invest seriously in mitigation, you can transform your effort, your investment as a benefit. And this is some, uh, some 
data for Alexandri, Casablanca, Tunis, and the uh, uh, Rabat that shows that we are still under the risk. And the risk is becoming more and more. And if you, don't, if you, have not, if you are not doing anything, we will have to face a serious situation. This is Mediterranean, and this is some, this is what, is what is requested. I can just throw your attention. The figure, the global figure, when we saw, saw this global figure, Mediterranean is the same color. But when you reduce the resolution, you can have some characteristic in our MENA region. And this study was done by, in, uh, in, in, in the context of CORDEX, and this is really kind of studies that should be improved and encouraged because with this we had a real vulnerability for the region. And this is something we should follow. This is critical. And this is also about still Mediterranean. This is, this is new, it is not in IPCC, it is 2016. But this is under the comparison between 1.5 scenario and the two degree. And this already shows in Mediterranean water availability, a scenario of 1.5 is by far better than two degree. This is something we should handle. And also, I should also, because we are about solution. Solution is a sort of Commitment, not from one singular entity. It should be from academia, research center, and also many departments, and also some international funding institutions. That means collaboration, integration. And what you said as this global pact is exactly in the same direction because we cannot do anything alone. So I will just go quickly, just to show you this, the sixth uh, cycle is very intense, but once again, the approval of 1.5 will be critical, instrumental for Talanoa Dialogue, as, as well as the final report for our sixth uh, assessment will be critical for global stock taking in two, in two, 2000. Uh, 2023. Just one, one final, one final slide. I don't want to. This is 1.5 special report live. And I want to highlight the fact that along this process. This is a good demonstration of a good interface between scientists and the government. Because initially, it is the government who decides to accept this special report. Second, scoping meeting is done by experts nominated by government. And the expert scientists pro propose the first draft it is sent to expert review and to a government review. The government make comment and we improve for second drafts. Until the end, at the end, it is government who are adopting the final report. Any report of IPCC, mainly summary for policymaker, is approved by government. Παρακαλώ να υποδεχτούμε τον εξωχότατο πρόεδρο της Κυπριακής Δημοκρατίας και την πρώτη κυρία. Excellencies, uh, distinguished friends, it is uh, indeed a great pleasure to welcome you tonight at the Presidential Palace on the occasion of the International Conference Climate Change in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, 
challenges and solutions. First and above all, I would like to express my deepest appreciation and congratulations to the Cyprus Institute for organizing this uh, very important conference, which addresses one of the most important challenges for our region for now and the years to come, climate change, and in particular, the impact of climate change in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East. I'm well aware through our various government departments, as well as uh, the work of the Cyprus Institute and their network of partners in the area, that our region in particular, is particularly vulnerable to the expected increase in droughts, heat extremes, and other consequences of climate change, which inevitably might disrupt social cohesion. It is no consequence that already many countries in our region, including Cyprus, are already experiencing a rise in temperature and increases in uh, freshwater uh, scarcity, forest free fires, frequency of uh, droughts, and growing rates of uh, desertification. Since we are located at the uh, heart of this geographical region, and as the only EU country in the Middle East, we are cognizant of the responsibility to be proactive, both in implementing adaptation measures uh, for our island and in assuming a leadership role for uh, mitigating the impact in the wider, in the wider region. Dear friends, thank you very much for being with us, for coming to Cyprus and to the Presidential Palace, and I wish you every success in your efforts and in our common goals. Thank you very much. Once again, welcome. Enjoy your stay in Cyprus. Mr. President and uh, Mr. President of the Constitutional Council of France, uh, Laurent Fabius, and uh, dear Costas, and uh, many friends and people uh, that I have learned from and admire uh, so much. It's really a, an incredibly uh, nice uh, privilege for me to have a few words with you this evening. The engineers have usefully sketched for us what to do. And it's actually all within reach from a technical and an economic point of view. And the answer is actually also relatively straightforward to understand, even for people like me who don't ask me to explain the physics or the engineering of it. But the fact is that we can move to zero carbon electricity, wind, solar, hydroelectric, geothermal, and nuclear. So we can get electricity without emission. We can move to transport that is almost entirely electrified with electric vehicles and mass transport. For the ships and the planes, we can move to synthetics or to advanced biofuels. And we can, of course, improve tremendously energy efficiency. Our cities around the world can be all electric, entirely run by clean energy. And this is already happening in some of the leading parts of the world. We were in Stockholm a couple of days ago. They'll reach zero emission in the 2030s. Oslo is committed to doing it in the 2020s. They're showing the way. All their power will be clean. All of their transport will be clean. Their building codes will enable high energy efficiency. Their heating will be electric or community cogeneration of heating. They will get to zero quickly and show that this can be done. And one of the beautiful facts is that every part of the world has solutions of this kind. This region, you have the most beautiful sunshine in the world. Who doesn't love the Mediterranean sunshine and the wind power that is available 
as well. And yet, with Europe and the Middle East and North Africa, despite the blueprints and the sketches, the desert tech ideas and the others, we have not moved to a connected grid of renewable energy. And that, again, is a matter of cooperation rather than even the economics or the, uh, the uh, certainly not the physics. That's a matter of politics. Even Europe, Mr. President, to this day, though it is the leader of setting goals, does not have a European plan for decarbonization because somebody's got lignite, somebody's got coal, and so everybody's supposed to do it on their own. Even one German lander won't let the wind power come from the North Seas because they don't want a transmission line overhead. And this will kill us. If not us, it will destroy the world of our children and our children's children if we are unable to solve these problems. They're not so hard to solve if we can look at this as a common challenge. I was in Beijing a couple of weeks ago. Everybody wants to know always, well, what is China doing? China is now the number one emitting country of the world. 28% of the CO2 emissions from China alone because it's a giant, it's an industrial giant, and it's a coal-based economy. I went because of, well, a number of conferences, but one was especially notable for me, a project that I hope we all come to know closely called GEI, Global Energy Interconnection propounded by President Xi and the China State Grid Company as a worldwide idea. Let's connect the renewable energy of the world in long distance, low loss, high voltage transmission, bring it to the world's population centers so that we have a clean grid that can power our industry, can power our homes, can power our mobility for the entire world. And in Chinese style, there were already dozens of countries represented at very high level there, and maps of cooperation for the whole world. I'd like to propose, Mr. President, that two things. One, in your capacity, of course, in uh, the Council of Europe, to push for a European plan. Because Europe needs not just a goal or an idea, it needs a grid. It needs to connect your renewable energy to the European grid. It needs Cyprus connected. Uh, underwater uh, high voltage transmission, proven technology. And it would be helpful for this country and helpful to connect, interconnect, uh, the Levant, the Middle East, North Africa, Europe into an interconnected renewable energy system. But I'd also like to suggest that maybe the Mediterranean, as truly the cradle of Western civilization, and I think of, I have to think uh, of civilization uh, for the world, uh, as the place where we learned so much how to do and how to live and how to enjoy life and how to celebrate life that maybe the Mediterranean, and by that I mean all of the complexity of the Mediterranean, the European Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey, North Africa, with all, Syria, with all its challenges, and all of the political con and violent conflicts could move together and propose a Mediterranean solution and show that in this region, above all of the political discord, the religious divisions, the ethnic divisions, the national divisions, the imperial histories, and all the rest, that the common championing of this most beautiful part of the world would take precedence for everybody, and that all the countries could work together and show that there's a practical way, a practical plan, a set of investments that could help 
to propel this transformation. Not only would you inspire the region, and not only would the region help to save the world, but also the region could lead a new way to peace by showing that by working together on the world's greatest challenge, we can also put aside the much lesser issues and find a way to peace. So I hope we can see not only the cradle of civilization, but the salvation of civilization in the Mediterranean. And we will keep coming to your most beautiful country and help you to get that done. Thank you very much. something, but at least if we follow this scenario, at least really well. So cool map is the critical area area, which was mentioned before, it's in the Middle East, actually most people live in the urban environment. So without much further ado, I would like to uh, start by calling uh, Professor Sachs uh, to open this closing session. So the renewable energy route is the best route. And a connected renewable energy route is vastly better than a solar panel on each building. In other words, a large-scale industrial renewable energy interconnected grid is a, by all calculations, a proper approach. There was an idea called Desert Tech, that's what I'm showing you here, which connects solar, concentrated solar thermal, photovoltaics, and wind power in uh, North Africa, the Middle East, uh, and uh, Europe. And this was a very good idea. Germany kind of quashed it after 2008, nine, partly energy nationalism. We don't want to rely on the Middle East for our uh, solar. Uh, partly uh, uh, Siemens uh, had its corruption crisis and dropped all initiatives, and it was probably the main industrial author uh, of uh, this idea. And then came the financial crisis and the general loss of will to think big. But this is a good idea. There was nothing wrong with the idea. It's a proper idea to connect North Africa, the Middle East, and Europe in an in interconnected. In lives lost and economic damage, between 98 and uh, 2013, climate-related extreme events cost almost 400 billion euros of economic losses in the European economic area. This accounts for 82% of the total reported losses due to the extreme events. And as uh, I heard, um, in your speech, Professor Sachs, last night at the dinner, um, you mentioned that because of the latest hurricanes in the USA, the cost is more than 300 billion US dollars. It's clear economic damage. So this percentage has possibly increased in recent decades and more in the near future. Some estimates indicate that annual economic losses could triple by 2020. This is 10 times the current damage by the end of the last century, entirely due to the climate change. These, dear friends, are shocking numbers. They paint a vivid picture of climate change potential for destruction. Last year was a particularly dramatic year for many countries, especially 
in uh, our continent and in particular in South Eastern Europe. Catastrophic forest fires in Portugal, Croatia, Spain, France, Italy, Greece, but also in Georgia, Montenegro, Albania, and Tunisia. Hurricane Ophelia and severe floods in UK, Ireland, and Greece. Deadly storms in Germany, Poland, Czech Republic, and Albania. So last year was a wake-up call for the European civil protection community. A year that made it clear, now is the time for action. Without delay, declarations and condolences are no longer enough. Uh, Jean Cher, the floor is yours. Dear uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first as chair of the scientific program committee of this conference, I wish to thank all of you for your attendance on the Saturday afternoon, as well as uh, all the excellent uh, talks that were providing, uh, provided uh, during the scientific workshop that preceded this conference, and during this conference, very inspiring talks on climate change challenges and solutions. I'm also delighted to have, uh, during this conference, a nice showcase how climate change is interconnected with energy and water resources, which are these three topics, energy, environment, and water, the three pillars of the research center I am responsible for at the Cypress Institute. Is, um, is a new concept that is already, well, um, showing very good results now, well, you cannot establish observations in the region without funds. This is a big limitation. But we have managed to start this observation here in Cyprus. And I have to say, with a great success and a great support of our international collaborators, we have opened our stations to our European colleagues. And this is some of our partners. And they have brought instrumentation. We have said, let's make science together. There is no observation here. It's a great challenge for us, for all of us, and it will make us even more competitive. Nobody knows about air pollution in the region. Everybody measures pollution in Europe. Nobody knows about here. So it attracts them naturally to make measurements here. We provide all the infrastructure for that. But at the same time, we provide an open access data strategy that is very important. We integrate our observation in big networks to make sure that all the scientific community will use our data. But we provide also transnational access, and this is a key success here for us. We bring researchers from Europe, we bring researchers from the Middle East, North Africa, here in Cyprus, they meet, and this is feeding the process of our strategy. Now, what this center will do for us, I will give you some points here, and one of them is to establish a new early warning system for desert dust. It has been shown during the workshop previously that atmospheric concentration of dust particles have drastically increased in the Middle East over the last 15 years. And this is one of, uh, of the satellite observation, aerosol optical data that support these uh, observations. This MCARE center will establish an early warning system with a LiDAR network that will be set up for better adapt adapting to desert dust, forecasting and, uh, and measuring at the regional level. New options to better mitigate air pollution, greenhouse gases emissions are highly localized in urban center mostly. 2% of the world era contains 98% of emissions. But these emissions for the, for the region here will concern mostly people in the MENA, living in the MENA region. Two thirds of the Mediterranean population we live in the Middle East, North Africa region by 2050. Not any more European people living. The majority will be from the MENA region. So MK will build a partnership with private stakeholders, something we didn't mention that much, but we need to engage our private partners in this effort. And we have done, we have managed to engage a couple of people there, a couple of groups. We will engage them to monitor pollution with high-density networks to better um, 
provide information on exposure of pollution using next generation of low cost sensors. We will have an independent method to monitor CO2 emissions. Currently, CO2 emissions are provided nationally, but you need a scientific independent method to verify the emissions from different countries. And we are here at the conversions of two hotspots in terms of CO2. You have the emissions from the European Union, 28, the Middle East. These are emissions of CO2, uh, yearly emissions given by uh, Carbon Atlas. And if you look at the trends in terms of CO2 emissions of these two regions, they are opposite. So we need here, we are at a strategic place to verify and monitor these emissions and the trends. And MCARE, with the help of CEA in France, will establish such regional center with capacities to derive CO2 emissions from satellites of constellation providing independent means of verification. That is crucial for commitments of the COP21 Paris Agreement. High resolution prediction will have better adaptation and we will develop this high resolution special, um, high resolution regional climate model that is needed to better adapt. This is something we are doing and we will enhance it, whatever. We, are, we will also develop new tools to improve extreme events simulation. Again, high resolution. This is, again, extremely critical to better adapt. It was mentioned this morning by the Department of Environment. We are an active supporter of the Implementation Strategy National Action Plan on Climate Change Adaptation for Cyprus. We have, we have played and we are playing an important role here in supporting Department of Environment in the implementation of this national action plan. Providing also new prediction for environmental impacts. This is already done, I'm illustrating here some works we have done in the past. Accident modeling and nuclear risk, vector-borne diseases modeling, air pollution health impact. We will provide new forecasting capacities that are very important to better adapt with mineral, mineral dust forecasting, Air quality forecasting system, again in support of public stakeholder Department of Labor Inspection in Cyprus. Numerical weather prediction, we already provide such support in Cyprus, we will enhance it. Last but not least, education, of course. Co-producing knowledge with end users to boost credibility, salience, legitimacy through learning processes, boost public opinion, boost capacity of future actors, boost decision capacity, boost dialogue between science and society. If we want to act in a positive and fruitful way, uh, it's a new sort of diplomacy. Uh, there's only one thing uh, on which I don't agree with you, uh, Jeffrey, for obvious reasons, is when you've said that some people have signed the Paris Agreement because they did not understand what was in it. Um, I, I could agree that some of them were not so enthusiastic. Yeah. But uh, precisely it meant that they had understood. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, after the success of the Paris uh, Agreement, uh, I tried to understand why. Because uh, uh, because uh, why this success? Because honestly, uh, on the spot, it was not clear for me. Uh, I know that it's better not to understand why you get a success than to understand why you have a failure. But, but anyway, which is a French habit. But, but um, not only French. But, but, uh, but I think one of the reasons is that uh, it was a sort of new kind of diplomacy. If I compare... Uh, and forgive me for the comparison. Uh, the most famous agreement at the beginning of the 19th century, the Congrès de Vienne, after the defeat of Napoleon, and exactly two centuries after Paris Agreement, uh, the differences are obvious. Uh, in Vienna, uh, there were, I don't know, five or six, uh, they were uh, in the same palace during months. Everything was secret. 
they were only uh, the representatives of the states, and they were discussing about exchanging territories. In Paris, we were 30,000. <laughs> Nothing was secret. <laughs> and uh, it was not only the states, but also all the stakeholders were there. And uh, with uh, a reasonable preparation and, and um, effort in organization, we have made it. And I think new diplomacy probably is more that sort of model, which means that to implement what you have in mind, Jeffrey, uh, obviously the governments are, are essential because at the end of the day, uh, they vote yes or no. But we need to insist on parliaments. We need to have with us the NGOs, to have uh, with us uh, the companies, to have with us the scientific community. Uh, this community has to be independent, but independent doesn't mean to be out of the world. You have to, we have to have with us civil society. And uh, I think what was true for Paris is true for, I would say, your plan. Anyway, for the new actions we have to implement. That's my first final comment. And the second one, I remember a chat I had with Michael Bloomberg uh, before, uh, well, it was probably two years ago. And uh, we were uh, discussing about uh, what are the mistakes uh, to avoid and what are uh, the ways to follow. And uh, I think, uh, I don't know if he said that or I said that, but anyway, things uh, that I will uh, explain now, I think they are still true. Obviously, uh, the climate disruption problem uh, is a long-term problem. Obviously, um, the negative effects of uh, climate change today are awful, and much more awful than is generally thought or said. And the new figures, which will be published in the coming months, uh, will be, well, we can uh, qualify them, but anyway, very negative. But if we want to have the people with us, and it is both through people that we can have the government with us, we have not only to be long-term and negative, but also to be short-term and positive. Short-term because it is absolute necessity. It's a matter of urgency. And positive, because if you explain to ordinary people in the street that the problem will, take, will, will come in 50 years and that anyway there is nothing to do, okay, it will be back in one's home, uh, it will light the TV on, and okay. Therefore, let's not forget that it is a very long-term issue, that to a certain extent, it's a tragedy, but let's also explain that if we tackle in the right way this problem, it can be and it will be positive and terribly positive for the population and that it is urgent. I have finished um, remembering that along according to the famous sentence, it is not because things are difficult that we don't do them, it is because we don't do them that they are difficult. Thank you. Hmm.